Good evening, everybody. It's good to have another um, webinar, kind of a virtual farm tour that we've had over the last couple of years. So I would think most a lot of you would have been on on before. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Aileen Buchanan. I run the Northeast Organic Discussion Group. Um, I've also got my colleague Craig Bothwell with me tonight, who is in the background making all the the technology works. I'm not very good on the, the technology. He'll also make sure that I don't miss any questions. Um, um, hopefully the plan for tonight is we'll run for about an hour and a half and um, finishing at uh, nine o'clock. Um, we'll have four videos, um, an introduction, winter bale grazing and winter grazing for the crops and then deer, looking at the deer and also a question and answer session. Um, for the, if you want to ask questions, you can either put them in the chat or there's also a question and answer function at the bottom of your, um, you should see on the, the toolbar if you want to, um, to answer the questions, ask questions there. But we'll try and keep a lot of the discussion till the end, but do ask questions. You can put questions in either um, the question and answer or the, the chat. We'll have a bit break in between for a bit of discussion in between each of the, the videos. So I would like to firstly introduce um, Stuart Mitchell and thank him very much for um, agreeing to, to host tonight and have us round to the, the farm, to look round the, the farm. And um, the filming's already happened. Um, a Stuart farms at uh, with, uh which is down in the borders, along with his wife and his parents. Um, he is, um, they were in the finalists for the Farmers Weekly Award um, this year. So one of the three finals in the mixed farming um, category. And also they were a, a monitor farm, Borders Monitor Farm in the past. Um, they just finished their organic conversion um, in August there. Um, but well, I think without further ado, because I think um, he does a lot of the introduction, we'll just go on to the, the first video with the, which gives an introduction into White Riggs. I'm Stuart Mitchell, um, I farm here at White Riggs in the Scottish Borders with uh, my parents and my wife. It's a thousand acre farm, uh, 442 hectares, ranging from uh, 500 feet up to 1400 feet. We farm cattle, deer and arable all organically. So we've got 140 uh, suckler cows, shorthorn cross angusies. They do, they suit us really well. They're great mothers uh, and can produce well off uh, just forage. We also have 350 red deer, which was an enterprise started in 2018. We also have 50 hectares of organic cereals. The organic cereals are uh, winter oats and spring barley. Sell the winter oats to Hogarth, a local mill for milling. And currently the spring barley is sold uh, direct to other farms for feeding. We are now organic. We have just finished our conversion uh, in August this year. We decided to go organic because we thought we were pretty much there already. We were never that reliant on fertilisers um, or warmers and things. And uh, when we got, when we um, dispersed our sheep flock, uh, we felt that just having cattle, deer and arable was quite a, a seamless transition to be organic. And we, all read, we were already big users of um, clover in our rotations. Big highs of organic, um, especially this year, has been not having a fertiliser bill. We've learned a lot about um, using like different ways of warmers and not need, well, we don't really use them anymore. Um, and learning not to rely on them. Uh, before we went organic, we were probably pretty traditional grazing, uh, a lot of set stocked, four or five bulling groups across, uh, needed split up across the farm and then the sheep all set stocked in between. Now we are in a, a mob grazing system, yeah, tall grazing, big covers. The cows are moved every day, all, all year. 
yeah, ate the big covers and we, yeah, there's one bit, one mob of cows and one mob of heifers and heifers with calves at foot and they stay in those two groups all year uh, and we just, we've just got a group of six bulls that we just divide in half and uh, put them into each mob. Yeah, uh, behind the sea we've, I've got a mob of 90 cows with 90 calves. They've been mobbed up since uh, they started calving back in middle of April. We accept we're not going to get the mauling calf, but if we can get around about 90% um, at scaling time, it means we're only keeping the very best productive cows and keeping it as efficient as possible. Main bit of advice I would give, don't try and fight the rules. Um, farm along with what the organic contention is. Makes life a whole lot easier. And um, yeah, you reap the benefits rather than trying to farm conventionally but without fertilizer or warmers to your control. Thank you, Stuart. That was a good introduction into kind of everything. And you started talking about your mob grazing there. I don't know if you want to kind of see a bit more for an introduction before we go into the winter bale grazing. Uh, yeah, we, we, we graze tall grass pretty much all year now. The cows are moved every single morning, uh, just once a day. Um, the bigger the cover, the better, really. Um, Diff throughout the year, the grass comes back differently. In the sp spring, it's quite lush, uh, it grows really quick. The summer, it, it, it's more headed and um, mature. And then the autumn uh, time, once we're off a of herbal haze, we, we get end up with quite a uh, lush grass again. So we, we uh, start putting in some straw bales and rolled into the paddock just each day. Um, just one is enough for the 90 cows. The, um, we started this in um, three years ago, I think now. Um, started in the spring, done a lot of research through COVID times, uh, a lot of webinars, and yeah, pretty much just learned it on the go. Just started by dividing fields in half, uh, bunching groups of cows up, and uh, you soon get the bug for it. And yeah, within uh, later that year, uh, we were um, down to, yeah, just the two mobs and moving every day on daily moves and tightening them up as much as we can. There's no set area each day. It all depends on the lay that's in front of them and yeah, how much um, dry matters in front of them. Uh, to keep them keep their bellies full all year. If it midsummer, we can pull them right back into quite s small bits. Um, but on like with the calves that are still going around it just now, um, if it gets wet, we just give them a bigger area each day. Uh, but it's yeah, it's flexible. It's only it's only one electric wire to reel out every day. Right, thank you. Um, that uh, brings us on nicely to the. The, the winter bale grazing but before we move on we've got a couple of questions which we'll just maybe kind of answer as we go and um, what the first one is what natural wormers do you use um yeah we don't really use what the cattle have not been warmed no cattle have been warmed at all for uh, three years as in yeah this winter they weren't warmed in the winter before they weren't warmed um no cows, mature adults, ever get wormed or fluked. Um, the only wormer we do use is um, in the deer um, with the young calves, um, and that's just a prevention for lungworm. Um, and that, unless there's any bother, any other like unforeseen thing, that's the only routine worm we'll, we'll ever use. So we don't really use natural warmers well a natural warmer is tall grass grazing uh let the cows eat the the grass away from where the the eggs are laid okay okay there's also a question about ribwort plantain being a possible natural warmer um but yeah. we'll maybe cover that when you go in and talk about terrible lays after we've watched later videos yeah 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 
So we'll maybe go on to the, the next um, video. Um, so almost all of our uh, cattle are out winter now. In this area here, um, we have uh, 60 cows uh, come up here after the wind. They get a bale of hay a day rolled out uh, with a bale and roller on the back of the uh, quad. Pretty much a nine meter wide, eight, nine to ten meter wide uh, strip of grass by about 300 meters. Um, and that does that group of cows uh, each day in the winter. Really simple system uh, where the, the hay is placed out here when it's made uh, midsummer. Uh, the grass, this grass up here is just grazed once in the summer and then uh, once in the winter. And we just dedicate this area uh, to our winter and keep the cows lower down in the summer. Main reason for hay um, is, well, do they really need silage? Uh, the hay, is made in June when the uh, June July time when the, the grass is still really uh, quite good, the, um, and we also make them into five foot bales, uh, which is probably about twice the dry matter of a, a four foot silage bale. Um, and we save on plastic. We get very little waste uh, up here. When I say up here, we are winning the cows between a uh, thousand and fourteen hundred feet on base of a hillside. They have got the run back of a wood for shelter because they don't get a, they don't really get a bark fence unless we know it's uh, better weather. And um, But the cows never really look for shelter. They just concentrate on having a full belly every day. And they, yeah, they spend the first couple of hours eating the bale uh, and then the rest of the day eating the grass. Uh, and then by the next morning, they're, uh, they're just waiting on their, their next block. And so they don't really go back and poach other areas to just get a fresh uh, lie of grass each day. Class this is uh, deferred grass. Uh, so there is, it basically it gets six months rest. Uh, we need some headed grass, but the reason we give it a graze in the summer is so we get a lot of green lush material comes back through in time for the winter but it's also a really thick mat which holds the cattle up well through the winter once they've uh, grazed it. Um, but it, during the winter they, they graze it just about to the board and then, but they don't go back really because there's not much uh, regrowth on it. But it's not, it's not poached um, at all really because they're always on a fresh strip of grass every day. Um, we also do this system where heifers, uh, they come up here uh, they've also got a field lower down that we do the same thing on. We select our 60 best cows to come up here, um, whereas the heifers, everything has to be up here uh, because it, it either has to cope with this system or it's not going to suit us at all. So the first, yeah, bull and heifers and then heifers with calves at foot, uh, they, they have to tough a winter uh, no matter what. This hill was previously just grazed uh, with sheep through the summer. Um, whereas nowadays we're increasing the fertility of the cell quite a lot because it gets the dung from 60 cows all winter and uh, all this hay and silage um, is also um, eaten and what's not eaten is, uh, is brought up onto the hill so rather than being spread with a muck spreader on, on your better fields through the summer uh, it means the whole farm's getting improved all the time. Good. I would just go back to questions. One just came in just as we were starting there, Stuart, about whether somebody had heard, right, you're running your bulling, both your bulling heifers and your calf heifers together. Uh, yes. So uh, we um, calve at two year old, um, have done for a, about five, six or seven years now. Um, so once those heifers calve um, we keep them away for the rest of the cows and then we sell or store cattle a year old at base at the end of May which is just at the end of calving um, so that at that time the heifers are split away from the bullocks and the 
the heifers were not keeping and they just join the heifers uh, that have just calved to their, um, their calf. So it's basically a year old heifers and two year old heifers. And they've run as a group of about 60 the rest of the summer. Right, thank you. Uh, Craig, I think we'll just go straight on to the next um, next video. We have uh, winter oats and winter uh, and spring barley. This is a field of winter oats. We plan to get almost all our winter grain sown by the 15th of September. Uh, this gives us a good bit of growth for us early on, gets a good cover to keep the weeds out, um, but also it gives us enough growth to give to let us put um, weaned calves uh, onto this in December and then the last thing they do before they're housed and then uh, it'll be grazed on their um, at turnout again in the spring, mainly to help it tell her uh, reduce disease and um, also gives us two to three weeks extra grazing through the winter. We've got 50 hectares of cereals, 36 of it is winter oats. It's yeah, traditional ploughed and then combi drilled. Uh, we don't roll it, uh, main reason is so if there is any weeds it's easily harrowed uh, to pull them out again. It'll be then harrowed in the spring and then that's it, the gate's shut until harvest time. The, we have got one small trial going just now of direct drilling, um, which is basically ploughing out of grassland, uh, planting spring barley, and then over sowing uh, clover into that. Through to harvest, we then uh, direct drill in winter oats into the clover and then that is our uh, fertility building and our weed suppression for that crop for the year. Uh, and then we'll do it again uh, to get three crops out and then it'll be just um, dissed up and uh, sown with herbally after that, which traditional uh, or sort of what we do now, we aim to get uh, three crops of uh, cereal and then after the last crop, which will be winter oats, it's uh, disked uh, before the middle of August and planted the herbally. Uh, and that's how we establish our grass. It's just dissed and then straight into a combi drill. And that's it. All our grass that's uh, sown now is a herbal A. Um, and it's all, yeah, it's all the same mixture. Uh, 20 different ingredients really. And yeah, it's just platted after our, our cereal rotation. And then it'll hopefully be there in some form for eight to 10, 12 years. Uh, something like that. There's 20% of the mix by weight is uh, clover, there's chicory, there's festolium, Timothy Coxfoot uh, adds up to 30% uh, and there's only one ryegrass which is just Toddington which is a late one. Uh, we're not, yeah, we don't use ryegrass very much now at all. Yeah, even though we plant the same herbal mix every time, it establishes different every year. Um, so, so some years it'll, the, the grasses will be more dominant, in other years there'll be a lot of uh, chicory planting, in other years it's uh, a lot of red clover. Can't really put our finger on what causes it, but as long as there's a good mix established, we don't really care what comes up. Yeah, so when it comes to grazing these cereals in the winter, our main, we've got two benefits really. Uh, Probably the main one on the cereal side is uh, disease uh, reduction. Yeah, it can wipe out an awful lot of uh, just dirty stuff, and it, it at the time it, it's got a lot of root reserves to just to within a week it's back to the same height as it was. Um, and yeah, a bit of extra tailoring cleans out any weeds. Uh, but it is like cattle could make a mess of ploughed drilled uh, land so they're only in it for a couple of days uh, in each field and by the time they get round each field it, yeah, you're at your, um, your two weeks or whatever it is so the, um, whereas the yeah you cut you putting cows into here they would sink out of sight but young young stock are fine um, yeah and it, it's 
the stock side is it's an extra two weeks grazing uh, in the middle of winter. Thank you. Just before we move on to the deer and focus on the livestock, which is quite an interesting combination with your cattle, somebody was asking about what your uh, water setup was on the hill. Um, yeah, so the when the cows are on the the hill, um, they've got run back to a, a, a water trough that's a, a 300 gallon uh, concrete trough that just sits there. Um, it manages to cope pretty well with the frosts, just as long as it's not a, a really long frost. But uh, once they get uh, maybe a quarter of the way along, um, there's a few bits of springs come out that um, keep keep running um, and so that keeps them going up there because the way the hill is, um, all our spring water is um, comes off of there to a tank at the bottom of that field. So it, it takes a bit of, even in the summer, getting water high enough up on that hill. Um, the, through as much of the winter with the heifers, they're on a drag trough um, and yeah, we just have to keep an eye on their water situation. Uh, when it's fine on a, a frosty day like to this morning, because uh, it'll be running by lunchtime again. But um, if you get a continuous frost, uh, they just need to run back to somewhere where there's water. Because it's strip grazing rather than block grazing in the winter, so that they, all, they pretty much always have a, a run back to a water source of some sort. Right, thank you. And just before we move on, leave the cattle again, there's a, somebody's asking, do you have a target bulling weight for your heifers? Um, when we when we sell um, the heifers, the bullocks in May, the whole group were basically wanting the average to be about 400 kilos. Um, so it's probably just slightly less than that for an average for a heifer. Um, yeah, I don't want too big, um, but also we don't want too small. But the, yeah, the calves, I would say, they get weaned in uh, mid-November, and then the whole lot is put into one mob, one group, and they are in that group, every single one of them, right through till the end of May. Um, so it, we know like, nothing gets treated separately, and nothing also gets any grain at all. Um, yeah, it's just picking what suits best forage system in the spring. And then on that day, the heifers and bullocks get sold and we pick out our bull and heifers. Um, there's, yeah, it's just to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, and then when the, we scan, like we've got a six week bulling period, um, from the 8th of July. Um, so when we scan six weeks, six or eight weeks after that, um, the heifers are still, like this year there was five empty heifers um, and they're, they're still at a decent age to get sold on for somebody to finish them. Okay, thank you. Um, Craig, well, we'll maybe just move on to the, the video on the, showing the, the deer. Um, so here at Wetrigs we have now got 350 breeding hinds that are currently at the rut. We have built this up from um, a new enterprise in 2018, July 2018 the first deer arrived. It's been yeah quite a journey so far, just recently sold our first full Arctic load of uh, finished uh, deer. The, the deer are pretty much left to it throughout the year, very little intervention at all. Uh, even the, the breeding stock never get any wormers or vaccinations at all. Um, it's only the young stock that get a wormer once. Um, so for, for the deer, it's pretty straightforward for them to be organic. Grazing wise, they're set stocked twice a year at calving time and at the rut. Other times a year, we can bunch them up a bit and move them around. 
in the finishing stock get a lot of uh, red clover to finish them. And during the winter they're also strip grazed and bale grazed uh, with an electric fence every day. Um, just yeah, moved four or five metres a day. Their bodies naturally shut down in the winter so they only ever eat enough to maintain their body. What they eat is only enough to keep themselves going throughout the winter and then they, uh, when the better grass comes in the summer uh, they, grow, they grow again. Calving wise, calving probably about 90%. If we, when we scan them we calve about 96%, 97 and then obviously at calving time you lose a handful but it, they're, um, yeah, they're left to it. Uh, we don't go in the field, you'd probably have more hassle than what you'd save. Uh, they're quite protective and they know exactly where their calf is, whereas we would we'd never really find the, the problem. They'd go away and hide. Uh, and it's just, yeah, left nature to do its thing. And it, so it's a good way of only keeping the very best deer and uh, saves problems later on in the future as well. Yeah, we now have about 280 acres, whatever that is in hectares, uh, fenced off. Uh, for deer, uh, there's a laneway joins every single paddock from basically the hell back into the handling system and between every field. So when you're, when it comes to moving the deer, we they follow the snacker. Um, it is the only reason they ever get fed is so they, they know to follow us out the gate. They'll follow the bike, the noise of the bike with a snacker and then the buggy uh, follows up behind to get the stragglers. Uh, and then as soon as they're in the lane, they'll go anywhere on the farm to another field uh, without any hassle, even crossing the main road as well. We've built our own uh, deer handling system in the shed and we've got a corral system for outwintering some of the deer into the into this wood behind us. Um, and yeah, it works really well. The, we've learned a lot, we've had steep learning curves over the last few years, but um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, full steam ahead now. Thank you, Stuart. And somebody's asked a question that I was had got in my mind as well. Um, they're asking if you've got a separate area fenced off for the deer enterprises. I know integration with the cattle, and I was going to ask about rotation with the cattle as well. If you had one, um, so the the cows have not really been in the deer fields yet. Um, they will in time once we get enough fenced. Um, this year we managed to get a, one of the deer fields ploughed out uh, for a cereal. Um, and we're, yeah, we're constantly fencing, but the, um, with the deer being set stocked at certain times of the year, um, we're kind of, our plan is next year or maybe the year after is when we've got a lot of grass after calving, um, because they're really spaced out, the um, the cows will then once the deer are out of there, the cows will come in and mob graze through the long grass and can you press a reset button for the grass in the autumn? Um, so it's yes, the will get mixed, but it's uh, it's early days yet. Right, thank you. And while um, folk are kind of thinking up other questions to ask as well. Um, <coughs> um, but I'll go back and talk about the, the hay a bit. If the way, if you don't get good enough weather for getting a good uh, cut of hay, what do you do or kind of how have you coped with that in the, over the last couple of years? Uh, the last couple of years has been pretty easy for making hay. Um, we do need to bear in mind that it's it is Scotland and we're, we're not always going to get good hay making, me making weather. Um, but yeah, we don't, we, you always need good weather for silage really as well. We do it all ourselves. Um, we, because the hay is getting stored as such outside from the day it's made, it doesn't need to be good, like the perfect hay that wouldn't uh, heat up in a shed because it's always getting aired outside. So it's, yeah, it's pretty common for us to make hay in like three, even or three or four days. Um, cut one night, um, teddied the next day, 
and then Teddy the day after, and quite often it's bailed that next that night. Um, and yeah, we've just got the machinery to do it ourselves, and uh, yeah, it makes a difference. And we we don't really do a big batch of hay at one time. We just pick off blocks um, when the weather's there and when there's a chance, and don't bite off more than we can chew. But we do have a silage put in a forage wagon, and uh, we have kept our sheds stocked to straw um, for just like just in case. Um, yeah, there's plenty of options, but it's easier to try and make here and then fall back. But um, yeah, we've we've done it. So we've all like we've made hay every year for the last fifteen year at least, um, but not on the quantities that we do now. Thank you. There's a few questions coming in. So the first one is, um, where do you sell your deer? Uh, the deer uh, go direct to uh, Dovecote Park um, for Waitrose and Mark and Spencer's in, uh, in the, the abattoirs in Yorkshire. And then we've got, what is your annual rainfall, which kind of... Uh, it's pretty much a metre. Um, so yeah, we are we are in quite a wet area, um, but not not extremely wet. Uh, but this year we we well, dried up like most people. But uh, but I would yeah I would say like the the way we're grazing now is the we used to be, always be poached out sort of thing, uh, capping the soil where the sheep running over it in November, December. The cows always need to, needed to be housed first week of November, right through until um, the end of April, the third week of April. But um, so, yeah, it always felt like we were a really wet farm. Um, but now with the, yeah, long grass grazing, um, it's amazing what a change of system uh, changes your, how the water uh, system works in your farm. And, um, it soaks in rather than just puddling on the top. You talked quite a bit about the, the lighter, the young stock, the cattle, eh, grazing your winter cereals. Is there any plans? There's a question here about any plans to move the deer onto the winter cereals to graze them? Uh, yeah, the field is in winter cereal and a deer field will get grazed with the yearling hinds uh, probably mid-January, uh, after, shortly after they're scanned. Um, and yeah, depending on what group of deer is near it, uh, mid mid April it'll get a, another grazing, but it'll only be grazed for uh, yeah three three or four days uh, each time, just enough to nip it and not. I don't want them eat, to re to eat the regrowth at all. Mm. Uh, it just cleans it up, and um, yeah, it was a. Still a lot to learn. Um, a lot of people do it with sheep. We don't have the sheep. Um, I don't want the sheep. <laughs> but, um, the yeah, it, it, at harvest this year, it was noticeable how much less rust there was. Um, there was one field we, we didn't do it with because it, it wasn't quite established enough last winter, and the combine was pretty brown. Uh, whereas other fields, it, uh, there was nothing came off at all really. The yield, I wouldn't say you get a better yield or a worse yield, um, but the, it's mainly for the disease, a bit of tillering for the weed's sake and, um, yeah, a bit extra grazing through the winter. Good, there's a question here. I think you, you've just got tried, you talked about conventional uh, ploughing and sowing. But there's here. Have you got any plans for going looking at uh, no-till or mintel? Uh, yes. Um, so there was a picture in the video that I think it was shown as a herbalay, but it was actually um, a clove. It was our living mulch, as we call it, um, a clover understory planted into a spring cereal, and then there'll be um, it gets harvested. Um, and then the yeah, cattle go in it for a day, back out the direct. We bought a direct drill a couple of years ago, um, planted winter oats in it, 
Um, and it's just now it's a bit of a race who's going to win, who's going to outcompete each other, either the clover or the oats. Uh, but it'll get a grazing shortly, another one in the spring, and then it'll be left to harvest. Last year we tried the same. It was a failure and went in the silage pit, but we learned quite a lot. And um, it's looking a lot more promising this year. Uh, if it does work con uh, consistently enough, it'll reduce our costs massively. Obviously, uh, all the benefits of no till, um, like no plowing and uh, no less carbon getting released, less fuel getting used. Um, it's a lot quicker. Um, but being organic, there's not really a reset button, and I don't want all our cereals to end up in the silage pit one year. Also, got a question here about what kind of drill do you have? Uh, it's a Moore um, uni drill. It's the like the what would now be a sky drill. Uh, it's what 2004, I think, of age, but it's a six meter uh, drill. But as a thing for tr uh, trialing, basically, um, yeah, that's a field there. That was uh, oh, maybe a week. No, a month after it was sown. It's hard to see there, but it's a, it's a different field now. Um, yeah, so a six metre drill, we can get across the fields really well. We've tried, we've tried, had ideas for trial and other things that have not really worked, pasture cropping and whatnot. But, um, buying a drill that age, we knew the depreciation was pretty much off it. So it was, uh, yeah, it was quite, we're quite game to, try lots of things. If it works well, um, yeah, it'll save us a heck of a lot of money. And if not, well, it doesn't. Stuart, I was, I was maybe going to just jump in at this point and say you've done a lot of direct drilling on the hill as well and improved that somewhat. Can you maybe tell us a wee bit about that? Um, yeah, sort of direct drilling. The, where the cows are up on the hill this year, um, we thought... We wanted some clover up there, um, so we, in Coxfoot as well, really, the, a bit more diverse than just the, the old hill grass that's up there. Uh, so I, as soon as the cows came off, 10th of April, uh, to start calving, uh, and hopefully before the birds started nesting, we went to disc the hill once, and I just followed that with the combi drill. Uh, so it was only really going, oh, not even an inch deep. Um, and we plant, it was it was a mix for hurls called uh, drought resistant organic mix, which was a lot of clover, coxfoot, timothy, and fescues. Um, yeah, plantain and chicory in there as well. Um, we have had a heck of a dry summer, so it, it did test its droughtiness. Um, but it's yeah, it's looking quite good just now, and it, hopefully it'll be even better for next year. And are, are they cows going to get grazed on that this winter time? Yeah, so the cows are on the very top of the hill just now, uh, probably for about another week to 10 days, and then they'll come down a st step and, yeah, we'll start grazing that uh, from then. We'll just a bale of days, bale grazing across the hill. Enough bales there to get them through to the uh, first week of April. And um, the only other question I had there, Stuart, this way Aileen pulls together the rest of them, and, and Aileen introduced you that you were a monitor farm um, two or three years ago now, Stuart. Could you maybe just give us a, an update on the changes that, that you guys have done since becoming monitor farm farmers and how well how the farms really changed? Because we've sort of seen it at, at this <coughs> end, but we're on the, kind of a lot of the viewers maybe not know what was happening beforehand. Yeah, uh, where the heck do I start there? <laughs> um, so we, I keep saying we, um, we started the monitor farm in 2016, um, along with another nine other farmers in Scotland. And uh, so at the time, we were a thousand breeding ewes, 140 cattle, everything was finished at home, um, sold uh, direct. Uh, either well direct through to, either through the local market 
uh, through farm stock or um, the bullocks went to Morrison's. The yeah, we had a a lot of discussion how to get why our sheep weren't performing as good as they were. The turn yeah, a long story. I'll cut it short. That um, we had my divisna in the sheep. Uh, it was pretty hellish. The eighty-two percent of them ended up having it. So we dispersed the flock, uh, and that was the start of all these changes. Um, we had no, uh, even then we didn't think we wouldn't have sheep back, um, but we were pretty sickened with them that year with Beast for the East as well, and all the problems that MV brings. Um, so the sheep went away that autumn, uh, yeah, the first load of sheep between the tups with them, so that was the end of that. The so yeah, we kind of started off the next spring with quite a lot of grass. Um and yeah, we just uh yeah, changes kept coming. We introduced deer um at the time, and then because we had a lot of grass, we introduced out wintering cattle, and yeah, one thing led to another. Um and it yeah, we're just uh, taking out costs is our main thing just now. The, and the grain is now all sold uh, off farm as well. Uh, and next year it'll have its organic premium. The, when we started the Monta farm, the, our main objectives, there's two, was to get me prepared to run the business, um, which was uh, quite a big thing. And the was it was to be profitable uh, at the same level as what we are, but without subsidy. Um, and yeah, it's amazing what a group of farmers uh, bashing their heads together, uh, putting loads of ideas on the table. And uh, yeah, we managed to do it and we've, we've kept doing it. So it's, uh, it's in, but a lot of changes got started during the month of farm time, but it's, it just kept going. Uh, a lot of, yeah. It's been brilliant after it because of where it all started. But it takes, um, I'll just add this in, it takes your, you can't do it yourself. Uh, you need your experts, but you also need your family behind you to um, to give you the chance uh, to possibly make cock-ups, but the, you learn from them and um, yeah, da, yeah, that especially was, uh, didn't really believe we wouldn't wouldn't have sheep, but uh, I don't think you can say anything good about a sheep now. So I won there. <laughs> no, it's been it's been great to see. Can you guys go on and develop further? Um, you were talking about silage and your machinery and whatnot. Can you just show us or give us an idea of how a winter's day has changed since kind of having all the cattle outside in terms of tonnages of silage grown and 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 what you're doing now? <laughs> yeah. Um... So we used to be about uh, 1,600 tonne of silage into two separate pits. The, and that was and probably 1,500 four-foot bales of straw cut at home with another 500 bales at home. And, yeah, an awful lot of muck to spread. The, now um, there's... 300 five foot bales of hay, 124 foot bales of hay. The straw, we don't really need, we need a bit because they are housed, uh, the calves are housed for about 10 weeks. The deer take a little bit and um, we can't bring ourselves to put the chopper on in the combine yet. Um, but the, um, yeah, so it, we're, we still make some silage, probably still make about 600 tonne of silage for, in the pit each year, uh, which is which does the deer and um, the calves. And yeah, there's a handful of cows uh, come in, but well, they did last year, but there's, there's, the empties are sold this time or going away on Thursday. So they're, the sheds are going to be empty again on Thursday. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's a massive saving on fuel, not making as much silage um, and not carting home straw 
uh, spending the whole August cutting straw uh, and through the, yeah, and spreading muck, mucking out. Um, I could probably spread all the muck in a day uh, if I really put my mind to it. Um, whereas it used to take a lot of September, really, if it was dry. The Through the winter, we used to have two, a mixer wagon each farm, the bedding machine ran between them, the forklift ran between them. Um, now we've only got one mixer wagon for the deer and the calves. Uh, the other one sold, the bed machine sold. Um, the tractors are, um, because the bales are sat outside through the summer, the tractors sit and do not a lot through the winter. Um, and yeah, the forklift was probably be on about 600 hours a year now, before. Uh, it'll, it'll probably be at least half of that now. So yeah, things should last. We've got the machinery, uh, apart from the mixers are sold, we don't. The rest of the machinery will be kept and it'll just be it'll last a lot longer, hopefully. Good, good. That's a, a bit about the, the winter. Great, but can you give us a bit of background how you started in the, the, the you know, the, the batch, the grazing system? Uh, yeah, the mob grazing. Um, yeah, it would just, you get, I, you start off, no, where will I start? We, I had, yeah, done a whole lot of research uh, on this type of thing. It was just sort of getting fashionable a wee while ago. Um, and as much as our aim was to, uh, for biodiversity and help the soil, it's it was also a big thing to keep cows profitable. Um, and that, we don't necessarily get any more for what we sell, but the, the margin in between now is a lot more because of our reduced costs. Um, the cow, the, yeah, we just keep building covers. When pe most people are making silage in the spring, um, the, well, yeah, in May we used to make a lot of silage and whereas now that grass is all just grazed then and we start stockpiling as uh, quick as we can. Um, and that try and carry that stockpile through right through it's late into the autumn as we can before we go into the hill. Um, and with the stock being quite like the young cattle will be turned outside um, mid March. Um, so they would get the grass, that the, the calves, the sheep used to get um, and do quite well on it. And then the, by the time they are sold, the cows of are then going on their second rotation of the farm. Um, and it, yeah, with cows being in such a small area of the farm, it takes quite a while to get round the, round the whole farm. Um, and it'll, yeah, most fields are grazed probably four times a year. Um, so it's, it is quite long rest periods, but it's, um, it keeps the cows bellies full keep, but it's, it's also good, green grass it's not a uh, heady drunk stuff a lot of our um cattle graze the herbal lays through the summer the permanent pasture we've got is either made into hay or stockpiled for the winter uh, or later on in autumn um so they're on the it's basically a, a version of a tmr a mixed diet for the cows and calves all summer uh and that is they're mainly on what would have been arable fields uh, or silage fields have been depleted quite a lot in the past. And so we, with this mix, we don't intend taking any of it for silage. We want to build those fields back up and the cows are, yeah, doing a pretty good job of it just now. Good, thank you. I've got another question here just about uh, how you find the market? Um, are you? I think you mentioned selling selling your calf store. Do you find there's a good market for <coughs> organic stores? Uh, yeah, this was our first year doing it. Um, selling them with an organic certificate. The um, half of them uh, went through farm stock uh, and stayed quite local, um, just over the hill. Uh, and the other half actually went through Twitter. Uh, somebody liked what I was doing 
uh, how we were grazing our cattle on Twitter, wanted either organic or pasture for life cattle. Not that they they were certified back home, but they uh, had a wedding business, uh, and so they and they finished the cattle, so they tamed half them in the spring, and it was yeah, I was quite happy with that. Uh, but it's yeah, farm stock uh, is quite a does a lot for us uh, for selling stock, so we're quite happy with them as a which is a, a cooperative. Good. Go, going back to the going back to the 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 grazing again. It's I've got a question here about maintaining nutri soil nutrient supply, especially since some of the nutrients will be transferred from the hay fields to the winter winter grazing fields. Um. Yeah. But a lot of yes, yeah, so or some of the hay goes further up the hill, but a lot of uh, the hay, probably half of it, will stay in. Those fields, uh, we just put a bunch up into the corner, uh, put a fence around it, will graze it either once more or another twice. Um, and then in the autumn, those bales are spaced out um, uh, probably one to a hectare, yeah, one to 0.75 of a hectare. Um, and then it, at that time, it, it slows when the grass is really lush, the hay that's there slows the. The rotation up even more um, to keep them outside um, and extend our grazing season longer. Um, so it's not the nutrients aren't really getting; they're not leaving the field. Um, I would say the the stay where they're, but um, obviously they're growing cattle, so they're um, some of it will get taken off, but it's um, not a lot. So peace. Sticking with the calves, or wondering what um, goes through your mixer wagon just for the calves, whether it's silage or whether you've got something else in the mix. Uh, no, just um, silage, uh, good quality silage, um, a lot of clover in it, um, and they are it's still the silage you make is still on the back of when we used to finish lambs. It was like Italian ryegrass, red clover, or. Um, so that as much as there's not really much ryegrass left, there's a lot of red clover. Um, so it's, yeah, it kind of just is one cut now early on, uh, but we used to be two or even three cuts. Um, and yeah, no, no grain uh, at all. No, I'm not, I'm not against it. It just, it's an extra cost. And we, uh, like the calves won't really do an awful lot when they're housed through the winter. They're probably uh, hardly a half a kilo a day, um, but they don't come in until um, into the new year. They'll go, yeah, turned out mid March, get the best of grass then, and they get a heck of a lot of compensated growth, and they're up to about two kilos a day. So that that's why we sell them at the end of May. Uh, we make the most of our grass in the spring, um, and that's and yeah, they're at the stage that we want them at the end of May. So it, as long as it's rather than weighing them to keep a, a steady growth through the, the winter, um, as long as uh, they're at the size up in the spring, uh, I'm quite happy. But it's going back. Like, I've learned a lot with the deer. They shut down the winter, have a lot of growth in the spring. Um, and yeah, it's going to keep it as natural as possible, really. Thank you. Interesting. Um, here you find going back to the, looking back to the hay. Do you find you have to put extra net on the hay when it's left outside, or? And uh, um, I it's, it's I think the bale are set at two point seven rounds. Um, because because it's not getting moved uh, at all. It just uh, it gets sat there pretty much a week after it's made. Um, I think if we're moving it too much, uh, you might need more net, but the the net just gets cut off. Um, and yeah, we've got a bale and roller that we make that uh, takes them down the hill or pulls them about any field. Because it was amazing to see that day we were up there filming how <clears throat> the bales have been sitting out and all that there is is a bit of bleach on them. There's very little waste at all, Stuart. Yeah, it, 
the art with like five foot bales out of my kale baler, they're parked as tight as it'll go. Um, so yeah, the only darkness that really gets into them is an inch on the bottom that comes back up for the soil. Um, the top, the hay, the outside layer, or even the sides, it's not even, it's all gone. We don't like some of the people that are uh, sort of bale grazing are looking to put a lot of that seed bank back into the um, sort of reseed the, the areas. Our hay isn't taken off of the best of fields. Um, so we're, we're quite happy if they tidy up as much as possible. Good. Have you found any, you know, any need for mineral supplementation or now that you're, have you noticed any difference now that you've moved on to herbal lays as well? Um, I think we're still early enough. We've, might, we've stopped um, bolus and uh, kind of now the organic, but the through the summer, the, we've got a, an old, a super single tire we put a mineral bucket in it and it's just got uh powdered minerals and it, it just gets dragged about the each day with the, the water um some like bad weather they can get through it like but good weather through the summer they, they take very little of it um but yeah some our older grasses seem to take more they take more there um so it probably would show that the, the herbal lays are doing a benefit there but i think it, it'll take time to get a lot of deep roots in bringing things up to make a a noticeable difference um yeah have you ever considered using brassicas as a you know to strip the graze as a break crop <laughs> um yes we, we used to do it with um the the sheep with red start or with turnips, Swedes. Um, we did it the first year with the deer, um, but I didn't. I didn't think I could make a good enough job of it without buying in either hen pen or something uh, for brassicas, and I would need to plow it. And it no, I'm not against plowing, but it's for when you're in the winter, a ploughed field turns into a mess off easy. Whereas with the the deer, we've got a forage crop for them. It's grazing, but it's it's Westerwold Italian ryegrass and four different annual clovers that's planted each year, and you we get our grass off of there to make the bales, and then um, the aftermath is what is the winter um, grazing along with the, the bales, and that that works best for us because it's there's enough there for their belly. Uh, fill, but the they're not really poaching it because the grass has got a good enough hold, um, and it's only disked uh, in or even direct drilled in, um, and it yeah it keeps poaching to a minimum, uh, and there's yeah it, if we can get cereal crops off quick enough, um, which is kind of happening in more recent years. Um, Get notes off the first week of August. We can then get we could sometimes chance putting in a brassica uh, just for uh, later in the season grazing to keep the calves out even longer. But it's we're not. I think there's too much of a risk for us uh, having brassicas planted in the spring, and we don't get enough benefit off of them. Okay, thank you. Can we, I maybe kind of ask going back to the herbal lays? Um, what you see the benefits of the herbal lay as because you mentioned as well that it's um you get different uh kind of swords depending on on the year and yeah. you mentioned they'd be down for eight to twelve years but i don't think you've maybe been doing it for long enough to see but do you think there'll be much diversity by the the end of the, the period or um so yeah the the big benefit for us is a diverse mix, a bit of everything for the cows, a lot, heck of a lot of um, dry matter like to fill their bellies, slow rotation down, keep them in a uh, small area um, and only graze it a 
a few times a year. Uh, I don't. Um, yeah, I don't know how long they'll last. They're pretty, still looking pretty good just now. Um, our oldest one's three year old, but um, we're letting the each herb flower or herb clover, um, even the grass uh, mature each year at least once. Um, it puts a, a lot of reserves back down into its roots. So I'm hoping it'll there'll be enough energy there to keep it going for quite a few years. Um, and at the end, if it is a, a clover, coxfoot, timothy, um, fescue leaf for another five years after that, I'll still be pretty happy with that. Um, and then it might well get a, just an arable after a while again for another couple of years to walk in again. Okay. Do you have any further questions, Craig? Can you think of any questions or? Well, just to maybe sum up, uh, sure, what's what's the next two or three years bringing you? Where where do you see the farm going stocking wise, and has be anything else anything else planned? Um, ha, huh, the we're pretty much back up to the stocking rate of what we were before. Um, when you put it in pounds of meat sold off the farm, um, we are yeah back up to where we used to be. Um, but at the same time, we're not. We're now we're going, we're not buying in acres of straw each year. So I'm, yeah, quite happy with that. Um, we're not. Yeah, we're buying fertilizer either. Um, I don't. I'm quite happy where we are just now. The, we've done a heck of a lot of changes over the last five years. I think we can just settle um, for a wee bit, um, enjoy it. Um, and yeah, a young family. Um, it, this type of system now, um, yeah, it gives us plenty of time with them. And yeah, it's, uh, that's, yeah, I'm quite happy who we are. Not, like, there may be the plot. It's never not plans, but uh, the yeah, we're, we're kind of slack. You've, not, you, you've got the system where you, to where you need it to where you need it to be for kind of labour that's on the farm. I think so. Yeah, yeah. certainly. So the, I'm, not, just, I'm not looking well, to expand. I'm quite happy with the the area we've got and making the most out of it. Good. There's maybe just one last question here, Ellie, and I'll just mm -hmm. ask the question. Um, Whereabouts are the cows getting calved and how much? Well, what's the same question is what's your uh, calving management? So uh, maybe just sort of finish off on that, Stuart, and give us a, a run through of that, please. Yeah, so I'll kind of the cows are up on the hill, um, and then the last six weeks that they're up there, um, they get a silage bale instead of hay bale, uh, just a bit better quality for the last uh, while in their pregnancy. Roughly the tenth of April, the bales will finish. They all come down in, get a BVD vaccine, uh, and then they're they're housed in a. Well, they're in a shed, but they they get let out through the day, shut in at night, um, start calving uh, two or three days later, uh, and as soon as they've calved, um, and they're tagged, uh, they're back outside again uh, and on the rounds again. The, I've, I keep trying not to get tempted to out, uh, carve outside. I think the system we've got with them um, inside, we've, we've not quite got a perfect cow yet. Uh, so I think until we've got that, um, having them close at hand, um, if there is any problems, uh, and easy recording and um we know what yeah we know what we're we're doing i just check them before i go to bed and then when i get up in the morning um it's yeah keep it simple but every every time you, you touch a cow or whatever it's uh everything's recorded for not to keep heifers off of them in the future yeah, i suppose what you've been doing is cutting your uh, calving period down kind down to six weeks now so it's not a long period for you to have to have to be intervening. Yeah, uh, it's have. it's usually just over seventy five percent in the first three weeks, 
Um, it is pretty uh, quick going through it. Uh, and yeah, we've had bits of bull issues this year, but I think the like previous, well, this carbon uh, was all done and dusted in 38 days. Um, and it's, yeah, not having stragglers on uh, is, yeah, makes life a lot easier. And it means that as soon as the last cow's carved, uh, they just mob them up and um, keep it simple. And the whole, with them in, being in a mob, um, everything has to keep up um, the whole summer. Um, and they do, like, we have got a tiny wee calf in it, and it's amazing when it gets... Uh, in it's in the group uh it's amazing how well they do um yeah we don't have little pickles dotted about so yeah plenty of folk come and see the farm and they, they see it as it is everything's in that uh mob and uh but when you, you only have six weeks which is the reason for um well normally a 90 percent carving it was 84 uh, scanning it was 84 this year with some uh, hellish bad luck at bull, bull in time, but um, yeah, it does away with a heck of a lot of problems. Um, well, no, thank you very much, Stuart. If Alien, I'll just leave you to sum up. Yes, thank you, Stuart. That was really interesting. You've got you've been really kind of open, and we've touched on a, a lot of subjects. So, thank you, thank you very much, and and um, thank you, Craig, as well. For you know the farm pretty well; it's local to you. So having your insight as well has been beneficial, as well as doing the technology for me. Um, so I think we've had a a good evening with um, a lot of questions going back and forward. So I think that's been that's been quite good. Um, I think Craig, you're just going to. We've got a bit about the feedback. Um, Scottish is a FAS funded event, and um, the Scottish government are always. Um, interested in feedback and getting feedback from what farmers think about it. So we've got the link there, but you'll also be emailed with the, the feedback. So if you could fill that in, that would be great. And um, there is a prize draw um, for returned um, feedback forms that you'll be entered into a, a, a prize draw. So that will be, hopefully that'll be some incentive to get it fed back in if it's not just to improve and uh, give a bit of feedback on to the event tonight. But I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been really interesting with having Stuart there to kind of show us his enterprise and his farm. So I'd just like to kind of um, close the evening and thank everybody for attending and thank you again, Stuart. Much appreciated, Stuart. Thank you. I know you're right. Quite good. Thank you and good night.